Hello, and welcome to the Tudors Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com. If you're new to this show, welcome. If you've listened before, welcome back. In the last episode, part one of Life in Tudor England, I covered Tudor women, marriage, childbirth, fairs and markets, entertainment, average life, and food. If you missed out on that one, it's okay because each of these Tudor Life episodes can stand alone, so you can really listen to them in any order. As I stated in part one of this series, my passion is really the people of Tudor Court, not necessarily their everyday life. I love all the drama and crazy stories that we can retrieve from old letters and how they give us a glimpse into the personal lives of these amazing people. Understanding their everyday life is very important to understanding the entire person, and it's because of that and all of your requests that I have chosen to do this series. For those who are new here, I take a minute at the beginning of every show to thank the people who have been generous enough to donate and become patrons to keep this show going. I have two new patrons since the last episode that I need to thank. Bob with two B's and Anna K. Thank you so much and welcome to this gang of awesomeness. I'd also like to thank Peggy, Diana, Stacy, Christopher, Rachel H., Rachel D., Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Christine, Katie, Stacy, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary, Cynthia, Melissa S., Nicole, Mary, Cheryl, Carrie, Heather from the English Renaissance History Podcast, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, thank you for increasing your pledge, Megan, Melissa C., and Pat B. Before we start this episode, I need to take a minute to talk a bit about the show. If you're new to my podcast and phone me on iTunes, you are missing out on a bunch of episodes that came before I integrated with iTunes. If you're interested in hearing all of them, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tutors Dynasty and click on posts. I also have a link to them on TutorsDynasty.com in the menu. If you find me on iTunes, I'd also love to see some more ratings and comments there as well. The more reviews, the higher I will be on the recommendation list for other Tudor lovers. Without all of your support, I wouldn't be able to continue with these podcasts, so I cannot thank you all enough. You know what? It's not only my podcast that you support, but also my website. All the money received from patrons like you go right back into the show, the cost of running the website, and research materials, including subscriptions to those hidden or hard-to-find documents and books. Believe it or not, I do have a full-time day job, and this is something that I do in my ever-decreasing downtime. Creating a podcast can easily take 15 hours, something that maybe my husband is not too keen about, but it's my passion and he supports me. If you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, you can go to Patreon. Again, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and just click on become a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. I just wrapped up my month of giveaways on TudorsDynasty.com and my Facebook page. This was so much fun to do and so many of you participated. It was awesome. If you did not win, I am so sorry, but I do appreciate all of your support so much that I wish I could give each and every one of you something. I'm hoping to be able to do more book giveaways in the future, so be sure to subscribe to my website to stay notified. If you don't know how to do that or haven't already, please feel free to send me an email at tutorsweekly at gmail.com. That's tutorsweekly at gmail.com and I will send you a link. With that, this episode could not have happened without some wonderful books to guide me along the way. A big thanks to Ruth Goodman and her book, How to Be a Tutor, and also the Encyclopedia of Tudor England. Those two books were instrumental in obtaining proper information to relate to you. I will have an article transcript of this episode posted in a few days with all of my sources listed. Okay, let's get on with the show. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be transported back in time to life in Tudor England. When it comes to music in Tudor England, it's easy to forget what an important role it took in everyday life. Henry VIII alone is attributed to over 30 compositions. He wasn't only a composer, he sang, played the lute, virginals, organ, and wind instruments, including the recorder. 
he was also quite the dancer. In his younger years, he was really quite the catch. Music of this era was influenced by current events or personal experiences. Most of the Tudor household were musically inclined, and it was important to Henry VIII that his children were musically inclined as he was. His eldest child, Mary, could sing and play the lute and virginals. His second child, Elizabeth, was a little more like her father in the fact that she wrote some instrumental pieces and she also played the virginals. The king's longed-for heir was no different. Edward also played the lute and virginals and possibly the viol, which was a type of cello or violin. Now, the virginals would be a keyboard instrument of the harpsichord family, and the lute was a plucked string instrument with a long neck with frets. It had a rounded body with a flat front. For musical performances at court, the presence of recorders, flutes, virginals, and lutes were most common. Among the lower classes, it was common for bagpipes and fiddles to be played. During the 38-year reign of Henry VIII, both gentry and peerage became patrons of music and hiring musicians to play music within their households. Music really became an integral part of Tudor life, with musicians hired to perform at colleges and various events. Masks were common during the reign of Henry VIII and developed out of English tradition. Disguised dancers would perform a piece which would draw the crowd into a dance. Here's a quote from History of the Mask genre. During the reign of Henry VIII, courtiers began to take a greater role in the entertainment, often entering as the maskers or disguisers, and the entertainment began to include the taking out of nobility, the invitation to dance that was extended to nobility in the audience by the masked entertainers. Henry VIII played an important role developing the genre. He often took part in the events, set designs, and choreography. Henry enjoyed being part of the entertainment as well. We can look no further than Anne Boleyn's first recorded appearance at Tudor Court with the Chateau Vert pageant on Shrove Tide Tuesday, and it was performed at York Place, which later would become Whitehall Palace. Here's a quote from Eric Ives' biography on Anne Boleyn. The theme of the opening tournament on the 1st of March was unrequited love, and this was continued when festivities reached a climax on the evening of Shrove Tuesday with a characteristically Burgundian pageant, the assault on the Chateau Vert. There were eight court ladies involved, each cast as one of the qualities of the perfect mistress of chivalric tradition. Beauty, honor, perseverance, kindness, constancy, bounty, mercy, and pity, with Anne playing perseverance and her sister Mary, kindness. The king's sister Mary led as beauty, with the Countess of Devonshire as honor, two women who would be among Anne's most implacable opponents, while the other characters, Constancy, was played by Jane Parker, soon to be Anne's sister-in-law. They wore white satin, each with her character or reason picked out 24 times in yellow satin, and the headdresses were calls of Venetian gold set off by Milan bonnets. Opposite the ladies were the eight male virtues. These virtues constituted the ideal courtier. Amorousness, nobleness, youth, attendance, loyalty, pleasure, gentleness, and liberty. Of course, Henry VIII played the lead role for love. A beautiful contrast to the ladies in white satin, the men wore caps and coats of cloth of gold and tinsel, with blue velvet buskins, which were calf-high boots, and great mantle cloaks of blue satin. Each had 42 scrolls of yellow damask, in which were pasted in blue letters the name of the role they were to play. Masks with their elaborate set designs, beautiful costumes, and impressive stage mechanics were wonderful displays of majesty, power, and wealth. If you've ever watched the movie Footloose, this next story will sound a bit familiar to you. In June 1066 in Yorkshire, an alehouse keeper got into trouble for holding Sunday dances that were attracting over 100 young people to dance to the music of a piper and drummer. The problem was a little different than Footloose, as parishioners were more upset that the dances were happening on the Sabbath during church service than dancing alone. Dancing was a popular pastime among all of England. As a courtier, it was imperative to know all the dances in order to participate at court events. The king, Henry VIII, was a beautiful dancer, and he often used his skills leaping, quote, like a stag, to show off his strong calf muscles. 
He had also been reported to dance until dawn. Sometime around 1500, a man by the name of John Bannis created a book in which he kept notes on 26 dances as well as 13 pieces of music. The dances in his book are for two or three dancers, and his notes don't remark on the steps or motions, more on the patterns that were made from dancing in a group. Sir Thomas Eliot's book named The Governor used dance as a means to teach moral virtue and also described how each step reflected and encouraged certain noble qualities in the dancer. He went on to say how every dance began with a respectful bow or curtsy, and one can presume that they also ended as they had began. Tudor dances tended to be on the slower side and were more stately than the lower classes, country dances, but not all of them, as you'll see from these dance descriptions. The bass dances were noted for their formality, with small gliding steps in which the feet remain close to the ground. The partners hold hands with multiple combinations of small bows and a series of walking steps completed by drawing the back foot up to the leading foot. The Coronado dance was also for couples and was popular in the late 16th century during the Elizabethan era. This dance originated in Italy as a folk dance with running steps, but looks more like hopping to me. It was performed with small back and forth springing steps, later subdued to stately glides. Each couple held hands to move forward and backward or dropped hands to face each other or turn. The Pavan dance had basic movement to music in the 2-2 or 4-4 time and consisted of forward and backward steps. The dancers rose onto the balls of their feet and swayed from side to side. A column of couples circled the ballroom and the dancers occasionally sang. The pavan was customarily followed by its after dance, the vigorous galliard. The galliard dance was a vigorous and fun 16th century dance that would leave you sweaty, easily out of breath, and possibly laughing. Its four hopping steps and one high leap permitted athletic gentlemen to show off for their partners. Just imagine Henry VIII showing off his calves. Performed as the afterdance of the stately Pavan, the galliard originated in 15th century Italy. It was especially fashionable from about 1530 to 1620 in France, Spain, and England. Queen Elizabeth is said to have practiced the galliard as her morning exercise. With all that dancing and lack of today's standards of hygiene, one can imagine how the room smelled during these dances. In another of Sir Thomas Eliot's books, this one called The Castle of Health, written in 1541, he recommends that the morning routine should include a rub of the body with a coarse linen cloth, first softly and increasing to a much rougher rub, which would cause the skin to swell and turn red. This was intended to draw out the body's toxins through the open pores and then be carried away by the linen cloth. Members of court would generally smell sweet, actually, and they would do whatever they could to combat body order. The most important layer of clothing was the layer that was touching the skin. This is the piece that was washed most frequently because it absorbed all the sweaty and bodily fluids. These pieces of underwear were sometimes changed several times during the day to keep them clean and more pleasant smelling. Historian Ruth Goodman tested this method of hygiene over a three-month period during her everyday life, and nobody was the wiser. She wore a fine linen smock with a modern skirt and top over it. She also wore a pair of fine linen hose beneath a nice thick pair of woolen opaque tights. She changed the smock and hose daily and rubbed herself down with a linen cloth in the evening before bed. She did not shower or bathe for the three-month period. She commented that she remained remarkably smell-free, including her feet. Her skin stayed in good condition, and she commented that her skin was better than usual, even after all the hard rubbing. So maybe court didn't smell as badly as we had once believed. What about their hair, right? Washing their hair was not as common as it is today either. You see, there were so many health hangups of the time that it was not done often because warm water would open pores and allow illness in. So hair was washed with cold herb scented water when needed. People of the Tudor era also wore perfumes, but not necessarily like the perfumes we use today. As an example, rosemary was believed to help with memory, while lavender was thought to calm and cool an overheated brain. Perfume was a more natural source than a combination of chemicals that we use in present day. A posy of violets or a small linen bag filled with lavender flowers or the smoke of herbs burnt on a fire were more common. 
the one you probably recognize the most is rose oil. This was also used as a body perfume at Henry VIII's court. While using rose oil showed your societal ranking, so did your clothing. Clothing was an important indicator of your social class. Those working in general labor sector, like shepherds and laborers, were not allowed to wear any cloth that was imported. Henry VIII's first act of parliament contained sumptuary laws. This meant that certain fabrics and colors were combined to only the royal family. The acts of apparel stipulated that only royals could wear the color purple. Here's parts of the act from 1509 saying that sumptuary laws were passed during Henry's first parliament to preserve rank and ensure no subject dressed above their rank. These laws were passed and prohibited anyone below the rank of Knight of the Garter with the exception of certain lords, judges, and those of the King's Council and Mayor of London to wear velvet in their gown and doublet or satin or damask in his gown or coat. Others with the title of Earl or Higher could wear sable fur. With that being said, other furs could be worn by lower ranks. Here are some more specifics. Being it ordained by the authority of this present parliament that no person of what estate, condition, or degree that he be use in his apparel any cloth of gold of purple color or silk of purple color, but only the king, the queen, the king's mother, the king's children, and the king's brother and sisters. No man under a duke may use in any apparel of his body or upon his horses any cloth of gold of tissue. No man under the degree of earl may wear in his apparel any sable furs. No man under the degree of baron use in his apparel of his body or his horses any cloth of gold or cloth of silver of tinseled satin, nor no other silk or cloth mixed or embroidered with gold or silver. No man under the degree of knight of the garter wear in his gown or coat or any other of his apparel any velvet of the color of crimson or blue. And the council and mayors of the City of London, for the time being, use or wear any velvet in their gowns or riding coats or furs of Martrin in their apparel. There were also certain clauses that prohibited the wearing of foreign wools and furs, which protected local businesses and trade. In the 16th century, there was an unprecedented revolution in dress. First, the introduction of sleeves, which would now be made of different material and color than the gown itself. This opened up many options for sleeve changes with the dress. This opened up many options for sleeve changes with the same dress, offering a way to change your look without changing the dress. The sleeves themselves varied in style. Some were full and puffy, while others may have been padded or quilted and slashed with a tighter fit. There was also the option of a more square neck dress at this time that was more of a short waisted style, which made the stomacher look more formal. I love to look at portraits from this era, especially portraits of noble or aristocratic women. When we look at the portraits of the wives of Henry VIII, we see some of the most beautiful dresses of the early to mid 16th century. At this time, the length of a woman's gown marked her rank. If you were a countess, baroness, or a lady of a lower rank, you would be ranked by the length of your train. The amount of embroidery on the dress and petticoat also denoted the status of the woman. Small triangular pieces called stomachers were pinned across the front of the bodice and covered from the neckline, in some cases, to the waist. Not all stomachers were pinned, some were tied. Stomachers were an essential part of a woman's wardrobe. This piece of fabric could be changed out at the same time as the sleeves to completely change the look of a dress. While many stomachers were made to blend seamlessly with the dress, others were made to complement it with a contrasting pattern or color. The plainest type of shoe available was made of wood, but was covered in velvet or leather. These shoes were stitched and fastened with buckles and broad-headed ornamental screws or nails. There were also pantoffles and chopines. A pantoffle was like a slipper. A chopine was built with a high platform to protect the wearer's feet and dress from the mud, animal entrails, and fecal matter that was common in the city streets at the time. In modern day, we have things like sweatpants, leggings, yoga pants, and free-flowing dresses for comfort. This was not the luxury of the 16th century. Clothing was not made for comfort. It makes me wonder if wearing a shift to bed was like a woman in modern day removing her bra after a long day. Ladies, you know what I'm saying. Ah... <sighs> 
for men, it was of great public importance to be dressed well. A man's outfit signified his place in society, even more so than a woman's. Laws restricted a man's rights to wear certain fabric and colors to those within particular social strata, so thoughtless dressing could land a man in legal trouble. While styles of hats varied, common amongst the commoners of the time were the flat caps, which had been in use for much of the Tudor reign. These might be made of wool, felt, or leather and could be lined with a linen. Amongst the nobility, tall hats similar to a modern-day top hat featuring a tapering crown or an arched brim hat might be popular amongst both men and women. Italian-style bonnet hats also were popular during the period, and any of these hats could be made of a fine fabric over a frame of linen stiffened with gum. Leather was also a popular material for the construction of fashionable hats. Tudor men's legs were covered with hose, which had become two separate pieces. Upper stocks covered the top half of the leg, while the lower stocks covered the bottom. The differentiation between the two pieces is particularly clear in Henry's portrait. The emphasis on the width is continued all the way down to the shoes, called duckbill shoes. Duckbill shoes were flat and square in the front, made of leather and could be slashed for decoration. When we think of all the pieces that go into the ladies' gowns, one has to wonder, how did it all get clean? And how often? The outer garments belonging to the wealthy could not easily be washed. They would have to be brushed and also aired out. One had to be careful, especially with the garments that had delicate embroidery. Often these items were worn or used until they were to the point of looking unpleasant or no longer fashionable, and then the salvageable parts were kept while the rest was discarded. The soap available to wash clothes was not friendly to the finer fabrics. The soap available to wash clothes was not friendly to the finer fabrics such as silk, velvet, and brocades. However, it could be used for linens, the clothing worn closest to your skin. If an article of clothing had stains on it, it would be soaked in a tub of lye. Sometimes the clothes were layered up, balanced on sticks, in a large barrel or a buck tub, and the buck was patiently poured through them a number of times. This is a possible origin of the term passing the buck. Once it had been soaked in the lye, then the actual process of washing began to remove the lye from the cloth. These items were generally taken to the nearest water source, whether it be a river or a stream, and they would bat them with wooden poles called washing bats. If the linens were not white enough, human urine was used as a bleaching agent. Sounds disgusting, I know, but it was definitely effective. Here's a quote from the Wash Day Blues, How Do They Keep Clean, on the website Living History Today. Quote, Some soap was made at home or by itinerant soap makers. It involved boiling animal fat, most usually mutton, in vats of lye. When the mixture had reduced and started to harden, it was either shaped by hand or poured into wetted molds to dry and harden properly. The process was smelly, messy, and potentially dangerous and produced a harsh, caustic, alkaline soap. Sometimes the mixture would be reboiled more than once and be sieved and pressed before scents were added if the mixture was for personal use. In 1524, it was recorded as costing one shilling per pound, and soap makers could be fined for selling their soap too wet so that it weighed more. Country folk boiled up saponaria or soap warp to give a frothy and slightly greasy feeling cleansing lather, which, when in bloom, produces a delicate scent. After the washing was complete, then came, obviously, the drying. But back then, they didn't have electric dryers like we have today. It appears that clothes were spread on bushes or laid out in communal drying fields. In Southampton, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, a man had had a hand chopped off for stealing clothes from a communal field. The removal of his hand shows the value that clothing had then. So what did we learn from this episode? Well, we learned that music played an important role in Tudor life as well as dancing. We learned that people, especially those at Tudor court, maybe didn't smell as bad as we once believed. And we learned a bit about clothing and how to clean it. So that's where we'll wrap up this week's episode of Life in Tudor England. I'll do at least one more episode because there are so many topics to cover. Thank you so much again for joining me this week. Until next time.